SpaceX, the rocket company founded by the entrepreneur Elon Musk, is keeping quiet about a plan to board the Earth and high-speed internet access. During a press briefing with Musk about the Falcon Heavy rocket launch, Business Insider inquired about the Starlink, a global internet network project is informally known to no available. Off topic said Musk. Today's topic is Falcon Heavy. However, the secrecy is difficult for the SpaceX to maintain given public government's documents, leaks and incredible scale of its proposals. The company hopes to launch 4425 interlinked broadband internet satellites into the orbit some 700 to 800 miles above the Earth, plus another 7500 into the lower orbit. Musk's company has filed several documents with Federal Communication Commissions related to an early test of Starlink which involves the launch of two small telecommunication satellites called Microsat 2A and Microsat 2B. The FCC gave SpaceX FCC permissions for the test in November 2017, and their new document now reveals that SpaceX will piggyback the Microsat 2A and 2B onto its launch of the Spanish radar satellite called PAS. The mission is slated to lift off from Vandenberg Air Force Base on Saturday at 9.14 a.m. Eastern Time of U.S. aboard a Falcon 9 rocket, according to Space Flight Now. Why the SpaceX wants to become an internet service provider? Here are some reasons to find out. SpaceX is looking to corner an increasingly competitive race to establish a fast, pervasive and affordable internet access. The company thinks such a market is worth tens and if not hundreds of billions of dollars a year and will grow only more and more to people get online. The space-based satellite network that communicates with the cheap ground stations thinking goes uh, could circumvent or circumvent the headaches and the expense of an on-ground technologies. The common challenge is associated with the sighting and digging trenches, laying fibers, and dealing with the property rights or materially alleviated uh, through a space-based broadband network, said Patricia Cooper, SpaceX Vice President of Satellite Government Affairs, wrote in a May 2017 congressional testimony. A true global space-based internet network, if low-cost or provided for free to some regions, could solve the equal access issues by passing the whole planet with one GBPS internet. The global average for the internet speed per user in late 2015, according to Akame Strait of Internet Report, was 5.1 Mbps. That's about 200 times slower than SpaceX target, with most of the highest speeds tied up in the cable and the fiber optic connections. In July 2016, legal filing, SpaceX also pointed out that 4.2 billion people are offline for a wide range of reasons, but often also because the necessary connectivity is not present or not affordable, citing a jury report by Inesco's Broadband Commissions for Sustainable Development. So what is the mission for the Microsat, which is piggybacking with the Spanish satellite with SpaceX? Musk first discussed the satellite consultation project in January 2015, that the filing for an FCC applications to the best basic technologies that would support it at the time, said Musk. We are really talking about something which is in the long term, like rebuilding the internet in space, the goal will be to have a majority of the long distance internet traffic go over this network and about 10% of local consumers and business traffic. So that's still probably 90% of people's local access will come from the fiber but will be doing and to do 10% of businesses to the consumer direct and more than half of the long distance traffic. Our 1738 active satellites are currently orbiting the Earth. According to a database compiled by the Union of Concerned Scientists, in addition roughly 2600 dead satellites are likely floating in the space. But even factoring those in, SpaceX planned fleet would be nearly the three times larger than everything around or already in the space. The new FCC document suggests that the test pair of the satellites will be sent to orbit about 318 miles above the Earth. By comparison, the International Space Station orbits the planet about 250 miles up. Once in orbit, the SpaceX will use the satellite to test the communication with a number of ground stations, including the mobile vans and stationary sites according to the latest FCC documents. 
The list of connections includes the office of uh, Musk's electric car company Tesla, which sells uh, internet connected vehicles. SpaceX's latest FCC filing also indicates that the company is working with partners in the Brewster, Washington, and Cordoba, Argentina, Tromoso, Norway, and Aurora in New Zealand for its broadband network test. According to June 2015, the story in the Washington Post, Google and Fidelity invested $1 billion in Musk's company in a part to support the project. So it's a good guess that if and when the network becomes functional, those companies would partly assume control of it. Google parent company Alphabet is also working on its own efforts to bring internet connectivity from the skies using satellite balloons and drones. SpaceX is not alone in the quest to dominate the global high-speed internet from space. The company called OneWeb is pushing to have a similar plan approved. According to the Geek Wire, OneWeb was reportedly built up the alliance with Jeff Bezos and the upcoming aerospace company Blue Origin as well as the Virgin Airways and the Aerian Space of France. So what do you think of SpaceX's new testimonial? To launching more than 7,000 satellites on the atmospheres of Earth to connect free and less and cheap internet for the peoples of the world. Will it work or these are just publicity stunt or he can do anything as of Musk sent a car to the space. Climate change poses an unprecedented threat to the world. In the past two decades, we've seen the alarming rise of carbon emissions, resulting in rising global temperatures. This is the most urgent issue of our time, and we must make the most of our opportunities to solve it. We need to unlock investments in clean energy and efficient infrastructure in working towards climate-friendly development. It is time for collective action to find and implement solutions needed to reimagine our world's future. Green Sukuk in itself is a very interesting, very important instrument that is capable of meeting much of the demand that we're seeing throughout the world, both in terms of green finance as well as Islamic finance. So the combination of these two growing industries and the emergence of Green Sukuk allows investors both in the Islamic world and non-Islamic investors to also contribute to tackling this growing challenge. The Green Sukuk was very exciting for us. Um, not only is it the first Green Sukuk in the world, but more importantly, it's actually assisting our client to raise funding of their solar project. Cost-wise, to get the Green Sukuk, it's a nominal sum that uh, the client's very happy to pay. Uh, it's insignificant to the overall cost. I don't think it will be an impediment for anybody to try and get the Green Certification. The whole process took us about three weeks for us to obtain the highest level of certification, which is that green. It is uh, cost efficient, which is a very, very nominal cost for green issuance. Well, it is the first time we do a project of this scale in the country. So we need to ensure that in, in structuring uh, you know, funding for a project like this, we mitigate all the risks and we have to ensure certainty. This coupled with the fact that it is a green project, I, I think it makes it appealing. I think what we've seen is a very historic event. We have opened and unlocked another venue by which we can tackle climate change. By working together, we can build a safer, more sustainable world for us and for future generations. Why do we need to measure income and wealth? When we think about a person's economic well-being, we don't just think about how much they earn. We also think about their belongings and investments, including in education and skills. The same is true for a business. We gauge how well a business is doing based on both its income statement and its balance sheet. That's because income in a given year can always look profitable by selling off assets. But selling assets may affect the ability to generate income in the future. The true picture of economic health requires looking at both income and assets. Why is GDP not enough? When it comes to assessing a country's economy, we tend to only look at gross domestic product or GDP. 
that is, the value of goods and services produced in one year. However, used alone, GDP doesn't provide the full picture of the health of an economy. So what are a country's assets? A country's true wealth includes all produced capital, such as factories and roads, natural capital like forests and water, human capital, the educated labor force, and net foreign assets. Why is this important? By having accurate measures for how their wealth has changed over time, countries can get a better idea of how much wealth they have accumulated, where that wealth is, and how to invest to increase wealth in the years ahead. What is the World Bank doing to help? The World Bank is working with countries to go beyond GDP to measure wealth and build a more accurate picture of their economic well-being. This helps governments to plan for more sustainable economic growth. A new World Bank publication called The Changing Wealth of Nations provides 20 years of wealth accounting data for 141 countries. Only by having a clear understanding of our world's wealth can we plan for a more sustainable future. Post your comments below and if you like this video please give a thumbs up and follow us on social networks and subscribe to our channel. And thanks for watching. This is WC Daily. Think big. Think different. Bye.